Allison, get back up there on that stage. <laughs> we, want, we, we want Simon to see you. Yes. Allison was first hand experience with Morgellons and nanotechnology for over 21 years. She's accomplished healing multiple lesions in her brain. Her healing has been documented through successive MRI scans. Allison continues to be an ever evolving student of life. And that is Allison. Our second panel is Linda McCallum. For the past 40 years, can you see her, Simon? Yes, that's her. She's acknowledging you on the screen in case you can't see us at the time. Linda, as an intuitive counsel, has been working with her clients to assist them in their personal alchemy. She's been a student of RNC for 29 years, whether in her role as counsel, interviewer, host, or entrepreneur, entrepreneur, she brings clarity to complex matters for those in her audience. Linda's a wealth of wisdom with a dynamic love for life's possibilities. That is Linda. Now, our third panelist can stay backstage for a while because, boy, I have a little novel here <laughs> that I will condense since we've been delayed so long. But our third panelist, who I might add, has been a guest speaker here at the Triad Theater for several years and always draws a packed house of enthusiastic fans, it is none other than Dr. Michal Dudley. You. <laughs> he was a former Catholic cardinal and a professor of systemic theology and college president at Maynooth University of Ireland, and at one time advisor to Pope Jean Paul. Wow. This is yes, very, very powerful. Michal was one of the scholars also in the acclaimed movie What the Bleep Do We Know? and a writer of many books, including The Hamburger Universe, which is a bestseller, and the Orb Phenomenon. He's a, a specialist with the Orbs. He has lectured extensively internationally and at present is finalizing his forthcoming project, soon to be released, called Forbidden Truths. And with that, Michal, I hope you get strapped in. We'll get, you, we'll get your microphone to you momentarily. And let the show begin. Yeah. And girls in the front, excuse me, but make sure your microphone's on too, by the way. Go ahead, Miha. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for your perseverance at such a late hour in England. I hope you've recovered from the results of the general election yesterday and are in good shape to proceed here. But we have a, a wonderful group here assembled in a packed theater who have listened with enormous interest and have had their imagination spiked by the many presentations and interviews you have done over the years. So we are very privileged that you took the time for this live communication with us this evening. Now we're a little bit behind uh, our, our scheduled time, obviously, but of the many questions that the audience had, because we have received an enormous amount of questions here and have tried to sort them out, but I think a lot of them will emerge naturally in the course of our session this afternoon. But one of the things, of the many, many things about you that have fascinated me over the years is your description of how you as a person is made up. You have said that you are one-third mounted and so forth. 
And I wonder, could you tell us a little more by way of launching this discussion about the Atlantic realm and its interaction with us and where we all fit into it and whether there's something that we could do maybe to accelerate some exchange of information or contact that would be of help to us. First of all, I wish to say how privileged I am to speak with you from the triathlon. Everybody who is present is a very important person. You are very special because you understand the truth and you are seeking the truth. So first of all, I thank you. The question regarding a mantis, uh, or as you might say, mantis, My soul had to be composed of three parts, simply because while on earth, I had to be able to connect, not just to the human realm, but the realm from the fourth dimension. When an off-world group wishes to maintain a two-way communication and wishes to learn, and understand, they can't come here on their own and do it because there would not be a natural interaction. At the moment, human consciousness is not an evolved topic for many people to be able to stay in the same room as one of these creatures, let alone attempt to have a conversation. So by placing elements of different souls in living human bodies, they are able to interact, understand, and gain knowledge uh, on emotions. Most of these creatures do not have emotions. So that is a big part of my role. The Amantid race is not very well known. If you go on the internet, there are absolutely pages and pages uh, regarding the Draconis reptilians and the Grey race. But sadly, most people who write about mantis or mantids have not personal experience and are just copying from books or uh, stories handed down from other people. The mantids are divided into a hierarchical culture of three. First group are the doctors. They are perhaps the finest doctors that are off planet. The second group are the computer operators and the craft flyers. And the third group are those that are the officer class and their rank is shown by wearing a purple robe. And they take the, the term universal master. Now, I have a problem because being hierarchical, they clearly haven't evolved far enough. Because if you listen to Alex Collier, Alex Collier, who is a genuine person in my book, uh, meets fifth dimensional beings that don't have hierarchy. But the higher up the dimensional scale you go, the less need for a hierarchy. But in the fourth dimension, where the mountains are, it is a hierarchical structure. And just to put the matter straight, um, they refer to themselves as universal master because each multiverse contains a universe within it. So they uh, appoint one of their own to each verse that sits within the multiverse. And they do so because they have been accepted by a wide range of other creatures to be an arbiter uh, or a judge or a referee to sort out issues within that, that particular verse. So the creatures um, are very odd looking. Now I did try to send some email pictures through but we have had interference and it's not so surprising. So I'm going to hold up a drawing to the screen and I'm just wondering whether you'll see anything of it. So, 
This is the drawing that I usually show. Is that coming through? Can you see that? Okay, so I always put one mistake into all of my drawings, one deliberate mistake, simply because if somebody comes to me and says, I've seen this creature or that creature, and then they say to me, I've seen your drawings, but well, you know there's something wrong there, it should look like this. I actually know they're telling me the truth, that they have seen them. One, one question I always ask people who uh, tell me that they have a very close, strong relationship with reptilian beings, my question is, how do they walk? And if a person can't show me how they walk, then of course I'm somewhat concerned because if you know these creatures well, you know how many digits they have on their hands and how they walk. Um, so that creature I showed you was a mantid. That is a drawing that uh, I did of a situation that occurred in 1971. Um, and this is where I decided that I wanted to be um, more in contact with mantid group than with a reptilian group, simply because the mantid group have more compassion than the reptilian group. So I hope that's a, a good first answer to the first question. One second, sorry. Go. Do you yourself uh, remember a life as a man did, or is your first acquaintance with this realm, the one third of the soul that you described, or did you live a life previously as a man did yourself? <coughs> I did. Um, I, I always find it very difficult to mention some subjects, not because I have any difficulty or embarrassment myself, but because I understand that with, for many, um, for many humans, uh, some of the things I said, um, it's not just controversial, because you have evolved beyond controversy. But some of the things are um, place me in a position that seems quite high, and I have a a a I could call it a program that sounds rather threatening. But I have something that's placed in me to prevent me from becoming too important or too um, in England we say too big for boots. I don't know if you guys would understand. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, so I have a position as a mantid a very, very long time ago. Um, and I suppose the best way to describe it would be um, that position was a position of responsibility. That, that's a past life not on this planet. And why would a mantid wish to at least acquire some experience of creatures who live with emotions? What would be the advantage to the mantids from that experience? Hopefully all creatures that, that are in a higher dimension have reached that higher dimension because they have evolved through lower dimensions. They've made their way up the ladder. For many creatures who are non-human, they de-evolve the emotional side. They become much more analytical, uh, far more technological, and begin to lose the spiritual connection. Then they reach a point in their development where they see they have been going down a blind alley. They wish they to in what they've lost. It's a bit like what's happening on this planet. We are going full in the head for technology and we are outstripping our spiritual ability to maintain keeping up. And so if we've done it, many others have done it. And so one of the reasons that's one of the reasons is to combat and 
try to understand where they went wrong. The second reason would be there is a responsibility for Earth human. The mantid race has been associated with Earth for a very, very long time. And if we about the other strands of DNA that, that humans have, the, the two physical and the ten energetic, these strands connect with different races who all have a responsibility. So mantids are very much a key player in the development of humanity. In most cases, it's for the better. Um, but remember, I am only able to speak for the majority group. There are factions, uh, just as there are in any organization, which are not as beneficial to humanity. But the group I'm associated with is the, the, the main core group. Is it the case that there are other groups here who don't have as benign a connection with the human race. For example, perhaps the entities from Krakow. And some people have suggested that the reasons why the Draconians perhaps are here, and some others, is that they feed off the very negative energy that keeps us imprisoned. And their aim is to keep us constantly in a state of worthlessness powerlessness, guilt and fear, and they feed off of that energy. Is that perspective real in your, in your knowledge? Well, maybe we can go a little bit closer to home in the, the days of uh, ancient home. Very many amphitheaters were built where people would kill each other or race horses. Huge, huge stadium with hundreds, thousands of Roman citizens would sit and watch and get excited. They were predominantly built because those entities could be associated above those uh, big arena and uh, feast on the energy. Now, you talked about the Draconis reptilians. Um, you know, I was very interested to hear that you associated with the previous Pope. Um, I certainly would have that the Draconis Reptilians do walk many of the corridors in uh, the Holy See in the Vatican. <laughs> but, but not in what he sees. And if you are not in the inner circle, then you would not be privy to that. The interesting situation at the moment, and, and you will well know that there are two uh, telescopes, the Vatican offers. One is a red telescope, and one is a, uh, an ordinary electromagnetic telescope. They are looking for the return of um, their lords and masters. This is what they maintain these telescopes to mean to maintain a individual watch separate from NASA or anyone else. Um, because they wish to be able to connect with the return of um, what they would call their, their, their lords or their gods. However, at the moment the major group, off-world group that um, has communication with hardback officials are the Draconian reptilian, and uh, he was invited to a meeting in London, <coughs> in Great Britain, uh, which I cancelled at the last minute. And this was from representatives of the Vatican. So the Vatican sent representatives, or her clans sent representatives from the Vatican to London to meet me. This was back in <coughs> Um, and this was to discuss uh, the situation between off-world entities and Russia and America. In other words, there were some very serious situations taking place between your country, Russia, and off-world aliens. The Vatican had 
um, found out and um, contacted. So Vatican are very, very, very involved. The reason that the meeting never went ahead was because the uh, Vatican was remote viewed by somebody uh, and their plans for meeting and organising became uh, compromised because obviously they wanted to meet in secret and therefore the meeting had to be cancelled. Uh, and the Vatican obviously had a lot of psychic people who detected the breach of their psychic security. So I would say that there are many, many elite organisations, some working for the good, some working for the not so good. And we all have to trust ourselves as to who we think are genuine people. But certainly, in case of the Vatican, uh, I think it's a 50 50 split now. I think there are people there who, who really wish to prevent these um, off world thoughts from um, surviving off the energy that is created in a negative environment. So if you have uh, loving energy, that isn't worth anything to them. But if you have anger, hate, uh, violence, that is a lower end of frequency which they can use and, and deal with. So um, the answer is yes. That's exactly what they do. I think for a lot of people it's really important to know what to trust when contact appears when they have an opportunity um, to make a connection. I've had experience um, many years ago with um, a being that gave me, I'm an intuitive, and so this being gave me the ability to know an enormous amount, and I didn't know it was from the being, I thought it was just that my abilities expanded until I really focused and the being came into focus. And when I asked, um, are you in alignment with my intention, which is unity and evolution in terms of wholeness and love, he said no. And I said, well, what are you interested in? He said, power, and that I will give you, and I will make sure you have all the power you want. And I said, I'm not interested in that. And I said, I need you to leave, and he said, no. And I said, no, I want you to go. And he said, no. And I said, okay, I just won't work again until you're gone. And so it took me three weeks, about three weeks, and finally he left. I was under the false impression that all you had to do was ask directly what the intention was from that point on, and then you would be told. Later, I have worked with people who have had visitations, and they are dealing with beings that I've seen that will shapeshift, they will become Saint Germain, they will take on the form of anything, um, to, and they will lie, they will say anything, and the only thing that has helped me in knowing what's going on is frequency. So I was very interested in hearing, is there a way to phrase a question? Is there a symbol? Is there anything you've found that can assist people in knowing how to really relate to what's going on? Do you mean, in terms of dealing with alien culture, you ask me how can you ensure any contact you have the Peter is proof? Yes. Double correct. Yes. You you can't. Um, what you have to do is to first of all physically identify the creature. That's very important because um, we can have to put these creatures into categories. Certain uh, physical form creatures you can almost be sure are tiff to race, others are negative. But you've mentioned the word frequency, and there's your answer. Because when you ask a question of a creature or a person, you get a reply. You then have to judge whether that person or creature is telling you the truth. You ask your own soul 
whether this person is trustworthy. That is the only device you have. If you feel unsure or you are um, concerned, then cut all communication. If you have a very clear indication that the, that the creature is truthful and is loving and is there for the right reasons, then maintain that communication. So, at least in your case, the creature asked, answered you honestly. Yeah. But I think that was because you are psychic and you would have known if it had lied to you, which rather backs up my advice to you. So that if you are a psychic person, there's no point in them lying to you. So what he was trying, or she was trying to do, I think it was a mail from the energy that you gave me about. Yeah. What he was trying to do was to bully you into submission by saying, well, look, you're going to have to live with this because I hate going away. And in the end, you called it bluff because you outused its, its energy. You must understand that when a creature from another dimension comes into this reality, this is a much heavier uh, energy-based uh, realm, and it drains their energy very quickly. So they can't stay in this realm for very long. That's why when you see the orbs, that is the, um, we have an expert from orbs here, but this is the consciousness that comes through, and they can't stay too long, because to maintain that psychic connection from the different realms is, is a drain. So just trust yourself, uh, just as you would if you were out on the street, or to use your words, out on the sidewalk, and you met somebody and they wanted to sell you something, you have to decide whether you're going to buy from them. Just use the same skills that you use with humans, use it with them. Simon, I, I really want to um, take a moment to thank you for your recent interview with White TV in regards to the mind control chemtrails and Morgellons. It's a topic that clearly is not um, addressed by mainstream media. Um, and so I, it, it was so needed to be broached. And now it's gone worldwide, and I want to thank you for that. Um, and um, I'm a more gallons experiencer, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and, and ask you some questions because I've studied it on my own. I have no scientific background, um, but I've studied it on my own for 21 years um, because I was exposed to it 21 years ago. Um, and you identified it as, art well, uh, the interviewer actually, I think, identified this artificial structures under the skin, and then you commented that the body will grow that if you send it a DNA code. Can you give us more details about this process? Because you mentioned you can send a message for tiny things in the body to join and send a message. So I'm wondering, are you talking about the nanobots that were breathing in the chemtrails and that are um, in our time-release medicines and other daily necessities. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the nanotechnology which over the last 20 years on this planet has really developed in leaps and bounds um, has made a fundamental change to the, the top-end Illuminati plans for the human race. Uh, there are many old videos on the internet, quite genuinely reporting to show that uh, a number of people in the top end of the Illuminati wish to get rid of three quarters of the human population. And that was because they did not have the technology to control the human race. They now have. And the nanotechnology uh, is now at a point where if the elite get their way and the human race uh, take these devices willingly, then there will be no need to wipe out three quarters of the population because you know you attend a, a demonstration and uh, you criticize the government 
and then you find that they switch off these devices that are in your body. So chemtrails is one way of introducing this, but you're right, there are more targeted ways, and this is what they're trying to do, introduce targeted ways. In other words, you target a certain nanotechnology for an individual person. So you don't just blindly cover, like you would with a chemtrail, but you actually say, person A is going to have nanotechnology B, because we wish to control this individual in a certain way, because of the job this person has, or because of the influence this person has. Um, we, when we talk about Magellan's, I actually use the word portal, that um, your natural body will grow into these um, artificially placed parts that uh, can be introduced into the body, and that any nano um, robotic creatures, I'm going to call them creatures because if you think of Star Trek, the, the next generation, the character who played data, the big argument was whether he was actually a life force or not. Now, I have a very strong view that any creature that does not contain a soul is not a living creature. I, I consider anything that has a soul to be life and anything that's not to be artificial. These little robots in the bloodstream are not living. They're just automatically robots and they will congregate at these set points. And then when um, an electromagnetic or a scalar wave signal is sent, they will activate. What's of, that is interesting, but what's of more interest to me is the individuals who are targeted with this. It tends to be very psychic people or high-end scientists or researchers uh, people who either are with the elite or actually working against them. In the last sort of five, six years, we've seen experimentation taking place whereby they are attempting to fine tune what they've done. Well, I have to say, uh, it's taken me 20 years to be able to get the message across to the um, I observe it as genius mind. It's an amazing technology. Um, it, so it has, it did originally come from off world. And do you know who actually gave it to us? Yes. Can you tell us? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, 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 the reptilian base are one of the finest nanotechnology creators uh, and innovators anywhere, anywhere at all. Um, in fact, when on, on this planet we trade with money, that's the control system used. But outside of this planet, as I'm sure you're aware, money is very rare. And the reptilians trade in genetics and nanotechnology. Now, an example of this, this trade, um, is that when a human uh, interacts with uh, a mantid, in the fourth dimension, the mantid will usually have a nano chip placed here in the shoulder, and the human will place his or her hand on the shoulder, but actually Nordics have them as well, they place on the hand here, and you can connect electronically through the mantid, and if the mantid is operating a machine, a computer, you can connect directly to the machine computer. That nanotechnology is made by the reptilians. So this is um, not even back engineered. This was a gift, and actually it breaks universal law for a technologically advanced species to give technologically uh, backward species higher technology. It's actually illegal from a multiverse point of view. That is why when you had Bosworth incident in 1947, a mechanism had to be achieved 
that seeded advanced technology on the earth because it couldn't be given. <coughs> if you were given that technology, you would have broken the rules. Broken the rules. So a, a very complicated game had to be arranged for these craft to, there was a two craft to actually build them. Um, so, yes, reptilians are creating nanotechnology. So, um, I'm going to word this. Um, when the interviewer talked to you, he mentioned that a lot of G GIs were complaining of more gallons, but um, it actually did start 20 years ago. They uh, had three, well, they had three states, four laboratories. One was in Florida, one was in Texas, and two were in California. And they experimented on the general population within about a 20 mile radius, and I was 20 miles um, to the one in Florida. And so, um, I've been following this for two, for, for over 20 years, of course, because I've been experiencing it. And um, there are two people that come up, and I want to mention this because a lot of your YouTube, a lot of your interviews end up on YouTube. And I want to mention that um, there's a man that, um, and I love that you always say, um, how is it that you say, I think highly of this person. Of course, I've never met him, but his name is Cliff Carnicom, and he owns the Carnicom Institute. And I believe that he's a sincere and genius mind. And um, the other person I've studied is Dr. Hildegard Staninger, and I've studied her for a different reason. Um, she was the first person to publicly link Morgellons to nanotechnology, and she did it way before anybody else did. And I've been able to, uh, unable to research her credentials, but um, in her research papers, she cites a lot of DARPA funding and when she first posted her website for her company, which is called Integrative Health Systems, she uses I, uh, HIS um, as her insignia, and it, it, originally it said in his service, and it was the insignia of the Jesuits. So I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, but in regards to Cliff Carnicom, I want to mention the fact that in recently, in January 31st, 2014, he published a paper called Inhibited Growth of the So-Called Morgellons Condition in a Cultured, Cultured Environment. And he found that it, it is a biological agent combined with an environmental filament, which of course is the nanotechnology. And he found that a combination of three powerful antioxidants, including large doses of vitamin um, C, um, doses of NAC and glutathione can inhibit the growth. So I'm wondering if you have any other suggestions for people who want to protect themselves or heal themselves of this. Any, any negative equipment because of its special nature will thrive in corrupt environments. The more polluted your body, the faster these things will take on. It is absolutely imperative that you try and eat uh, food and drink fluids that are as clear of any chemical traces as you possibly can. Because the more operationally clear your body, then the harder it is for these things to survive. It's rather like um, a living creature that evolves in a polluted lake. If you were to take it out of its polluted lake and put it into very clean fresh water, it would probably die. These, these creatures, these, these devices, uh, shut down when placed in an environment of a higher frequency. So that is one way to retard the, the actual happening. The second uh, would be literally to use your mind or those around you who you may have of that level of psychic ability to be able to literally take out these things. There's a big difference between being spiritual and being psychic. You can be an incredibly spiritual person and not be psychic. You can be very psychic and not spiritual. What we need are both spiritual and psychic people. If you can get a group of three, four, five, six of those people in a circle, 
and we have somebody who is suffering from all of these attacks. Uh, combined with a good diet and good fluids, uh, you can energetically take these things out. And that is the only way, because surgery won't work, physical traditional surgery won't work. One, one other way, but it's dangerous to the organs, um, very powerful magnets. Very powerful magnets will actually um, make these things stop work. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is some evidence that shows that x-rays also have an effect. You can't expose your body to x-rays, but you can to magnetic waves. So, um, the ordinary person doesn't have access to the sort of powerful magnets that you need. So, psychic healers working in use, and that's your best work. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I hope that this does get an opportunity to get out there because there are a lot of people. We are close to a military base, and we have a huge military population here. And um, I have people occasionally knocking on my door asking questions, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Does anyone from the audience want to ask a question? If so, perhaps you might get ready to ask it when the next opportunity arises so we don't have any interruption. Simon, if I could <clears throat> come back again to the Vatican, which you <laughs> love so dearly. I'm very encouraged that, like the immediate last pope, you have a cat that you live with, as opposed to the other way around. <laughs> very encouraged by that. But anyway, you remember uh, 60, over 60 years ago, President Eisenhower met with a group of extraterrestrials at what's now Edward Air Force Base, Murak Field, in February of 1954. And he brought with him on that evening the man who was the Archbishop of Los Angeles at the time. And uh, of course that, that Archbishop was sworn to secrecy, but after a few days of thought, he decided to go to Rome to tell Pope Pius XII what had happened. His aircraft was forced down uh, after a couple of hours flight, but he insisted on proceeding, and he did communicate the whole thing to Pius XII. Apparently there was a meeting in the Vatican, between those same extraterrestrials and the Pope and two other people uh, on a couple of occasions, three times in the Vatican, two times here in the United States. Now, the group that first met the Pope were the same group that President Eisenhower met. And as you know, they offered uh, President Eisenhower advanced technology and so forth in exchange for abandoning the nuclear arms race, etc. To the Pope, they they said that he needed to prepare for a state of affairs where people would realize that the system of teaching of the church was no longer sustainable and that they would help that transition. And there was no response, obviously. It was an invitation to go out of business. <laughs> but a second group then approached the officials of the church and offered to help them to prop up the system that existed. It's the same group that, that came in here into this country to offer a different kind of interaction as opposed to the peaceful one that was offered to President Eisenhower. And that uh, ties in very much with what you said about the meeting that was arranged in England in March because the new Vatican astronomer, Monsignor Funes, of course, has been extremely interested in the possibility of contact with extraterrestrial life. But anyway, after that long introduction, I'm asking if you regard that second group that have made contact with the Vatican as part of the reptilian draconian alliance, whose aim is to use every means at their disposal, especially the religious persuasions, to enforce their system of subjugation and inferiority. About four or five days before the Roswell spacecraft crashed, the president authorized 
the highest chaplain in the United States Army or Air Force, I can't remember which one, to do a tour of all the military bases in that area. So they clearly knew there was going to be a heck of a shock for most of the military personnel. And remember back in those days, perhaps the connection with the church and religion was a lot stronger than it is now. So the church has always had a very key role to play in regards to any situation with extraterrestrials, simply because there is a possibility that once the majority of the people understand the truth, they might say, what is the point of religion? That is the latest hope who made that big, big public statement that he would baptise aliens. <laughs> and, you know, that's when I got the phone call from the, the BBC in Britain asking me for a comment because the new Pope had said that. Now, if I was in religious orders, I would be wishing to position myself into a mindset that allows the continuation of religion and not to be pushed out because the question of God is raised. I'm very clear. There is a God. And there will always be a God. But, and I have no problem with God. I have a problem with the structure that is built up to bring that God to humanity. Now you asked about the very important meetings. There was something else that was added which you probably just forgotten to, to mention. The first group that made the contact actually said that part of the arrangement would be for the Americans to give up their nuclear weapons. And it was this that prevented the president from doing any deal with them because he felt that he could not give up nuclear weapons. Now, when the second group arrived, they made no such request. And that was the principal reason that the American administration went with the second group because here appeared to be an opportunity whereby the administration would receive extraterrestrial technology and no reduction in military um, commitment. What the second alien group wanted was access to humans. They wanted the right to take people. And the American administration agreed providing a list of all the names of all of the people that were taken and providing that no harm came to them. And that is why in the film E.T., at the end of that film, you see lots of people going with the aliens into the spaceship. Now what happened was they reneged on the deal. So the list that the Americans got was never complete, and many people that were taken never came back. But by that time, um, the Americans were into a contract, and you have to understand, that, and I can't remember the, the cycle of this, but they had just been signed contracts. I mean, it may be every 12 years, but every so often, they, whoever is the leader, the president actually signs a contract for another few years to maintain the system because it's about free will. And as long as the leader of the major country in the world is signing the document, then he is free willing the authorization for these creatures to do what they want. Okay. It leaves me in listening um, to you to a couple of questions relating to what you're just talking about. I, I have two things that are so powerful. One is that 
I happened to have heard this morning, actually, before I came, uh, an hour of the interview you did um, on Mars and uh, with Randy and Faith. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it was so um, powerful. And it had a lot to do with this idea of life on Mars. Um, Randy is a U.S. Um, Marine on a U.S. base on Mars, and the idea that was said that the conflict between, in the government itself there, with those that want to continue and those that do not, um, those that are saying, uh, the soldiers that are saying we've lived our life uh, in service and our grandfathers and those before us and now we're asked to do things that we don't believe in anymore and so therefore we're leaving. Uh, we're not going to go along with what is being said and so this whole breakup is happening. At the same time, um, those that took over Mars were the Illuminati that wanted the total control that had the Nazi influence um, and those that are here, left, uh, are no longer the favorites. So they're being now second, and so they're dropping out. And so the information came, and I'm only spending time talking about this briefly because of people who may not have seen it, that the Illuminati, many of the families here that thought they were going to get the New World Order and take over are now recognizing that they're not in that position and they are also changing direction. And the change of that direction is typified by Rockefeller selling off oil um, and um, what I saw and the Navy, which was most important, which Randy shared, that the Navy is no longer going to use oil for its ships and they're the number one oil user in the world. Um, this is going to change the entire world um, because it's going to affect, it's the beginning of a whole shift of change of power in terms of oil. Russia's not using U.S. dollars to buy oil. Um, what is going to happen to the rest of the world as this shift happens and more and more Illuminati families left behind by the Aryan version um, begin to drop away, or are they? Um, what America maintains the largest surface fleet, ocean going fleet anywhere in the world, and the Navy um, has always had a very strong involvement in extraterrestrials, always. Ever since Forrest Hill, or before Forrest Hill jumped out of the hospital window and killed himself, mm -hmm. can, your, your country can't afford to have its surface fleet without oil. So, what they're doing now is they're buying oil at whichever port they land at. It doesn't come through the American system, and they don't necessarily pay in dollars for it. Because what the Navy knows is that there is a crisis coming. Um, and if the oil runs out, the fleet has to keep going. So that was the reason for that. Um, the Illuminati is not one organization. It is a club, but it is a club that's consistent of bloodlines at the top and those that serve the bloodlines. If you are bloodline, you cannot develop because you're energetically tied to a way of life. If you are not bloodline, you can rebel, but mind control programs placed in you and suicide programs placed in you will probably take you out or bring you under control. So many people that we see who are whistleblowers have either been deprogrammed of the mind control, or are actually acting as disinformation agents. But you're right, 
uh, there is a fracturing at the very top. And those that can leave Dodge, are leaving Dodge, and those that can't are looking to live in a bunker. Uh, last year, I did a, 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 a symposium, I did a talk uh, in England, and at the end of the talk, a very nice uh, American gentleman wanted to buy me lunch. Uh, in, in, in Britain, nobody buys you lunch. I know you Americans do that, but in Britain, if someone buys you lunch, they really do want something from you. <laughs> Uh, I actually got somebody over as a as a witness because I knew something big was going to go on, and the the gentleman um, uh, just said to me that he was here representing a group of very powerful people, and he had a message for me, and the message was that we know what you're saying is truth. Um, and we don't want anything bad to happen to you. And there's a possibility that something may, may happen to you. And I was offered uh, bodyguards at no cost. I was offered armored cars at no cost. And here's the really interesting one. I was offered an underground bunker for myself and my loved ones in case those at the very top did bring out the Third World War, um, and there would be a place for me to go. Now, that shows just how serious this possibility is in the minds of some people. Now, I actually quite like the idea of armoured cars. I like <laughs> But I won't buy into a bunker, because to do so is to give it energy, to do so is to bring its reality about. So, if we look at several timelines on Earth's history, this is exactly what's happened. Where one group have taken refuge under the Earth, and those that couldn't afford the hotel space stayed on top of the planet. And in those timelines where that occurred, those two races became very separate. This is a negative timeline. Unfortunately, we're not on that. So the timeline that we're on at the moment is a much more positive timeline for humanity. And, and so I really don't look for the need for bunkers of any sort. But nevertheless, this was a genuine offer made to me um, by an arm of the Illuminati which has taken itself away from the main group. So there is absolute evidence that within the top echelons, they are literally splitting and trying to warn people that there are some very crazy, crazy people who wish to bring harm to the planet. So it really is a very dangerous situation because there are these individuals who are hell-bent, I'm using the word deliberately, are hell-bent on bringing about destruction simply because they want to inherit a planet with nobody else. Now, 25 years ago, the vast majority of the Illuminati wanted to wipe out three quarters of the population so that they could enjoy the rivers and the forests and they could go to Central Park and not see another person. That to them was their just their idea. But now we have a very small group of people who wish to destroy everything and to hide underground and then to come out and claim whatever is left. That, that is the situation that we're facing. Um, and, you know, most people have children, grandchildren, and they can't buy into that. So you'd have to be very, very corrupt to want that. So yes, that, that, that is the situation you're right. Can I follow up on that? You mentioned contracts, and the contracts have to be renewed. And Obama is finishing his contract, 2016. 
And I'm looking at this year. Um, I have two questions here. One, in terms of Obama, when certain contracts are null and void, and the next version is coming in, is there an effect? Or do we have a chance to redo the agreements that have been done with the aliens? Uh, and what group is advising Obama? You said there are different alien groups advising all the leaders. Um, you didn't mention the name of that group. And also, I had heard that um, his family was held hostage, meaning if you don't do what we say, they're both your daughters and your wife. Um, I wondered if you could just give us some insight as to what is here and what is the potential. The, the, the Georgia Gladstones are dated 2016, and that's for a reason. Um, this is the, the creatures that are working with the Vatican and with Obama. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to be very unpopular now and tell you that actually Mr. Obama is actually a good person. Yeah. He's a good person that's been got at. Yeah. Somebody who doesn't want to do what he's doing, and you could see it in his face. When he comes up to the public and he's addressing the public, you can see the eternal conflict going on in him. Um, because any president knows that if they can murder JFK, they'll murder anyone. So why did Obama want to be a president? And the reality was he didn't. All of these people are picked and appointed before their age five. It is all agreed and organized so that they are trapped into a railroad and to get out of it would be the death of your family and you mentioned something along those lines uh, and you have to do it well no you don't have to do it because we have free will but you feel you have to do it because of the consequences to other people and I suppose uh, the human spirit is well you know maybe I can try and make things a bit better so, that is a situation. That, that, that is actually where we're at. And you've got these creatures who um, are influencing uh, Obama. There is another group who are half human and half reptilian, and they are very, very familiar. They're called the Anunnaki. Anunnaki inside profile are flat. Their faces are quite flat. Their noses are not very prominent. They have very flat uh, foreheads and their chins are flat, and they are half reptilian and half human. And the Anunnaki go right back to the days when uh, the human population was growing, and the off-worlders did not have enough um, people on the ground, so they gave power to these half-breeds, and that's when the city-states started on the planet Earth. So you create a city here and a city there, and each city had its own ruler, and you had a creature that was half human because he or she could then connect with the human population, but half alien because then the loyalty was with them. And this is why we have presidents and prime ministers. That's exactly the principle. You have an appointed person in an area controlling that sector. You have another person here controlling that sector. But they all feed back. Some of them feed directly. You mentioned the Rothschilds. Some do not feed back directly, but go through intermediaries. So you have uh, a higher group, which we would call the Archons, which are a non-physical, artificial intelligence life form. You have a reptilian force. You have the half and half, the Anunnaki force. You mentioned um, um, Nazis. You have those from the old Bar group. Um, you have a whole host of very negative forces who associate themselves with America because America was accepted as the spokesman, I'm using that word male deliberately, 
was accepted as the spokesman for the world. So you have to understand that off-world entities in the fourth dimension uh, accept America as the spokesperson for the whole planet. So you don't go to uh, China or India, you go to America. And that's why what's happened with Putin is now very different, because Putin does not want to work with those groups. That's why Russia was split. Thank you so much. Simon, uh, we've been noticing here for the past few years the apparent coincidence between major earthquakes, say like the one in Kathmandu uh, recently, and the activation of the CERN collider. Do you think, number one, that there is a connection between the activation of that collider now in its much more powerful form? And number two, if some of these groups that are disaffected or perceive themselves as disadvantaged here are trying to create some kind of portal using that device. So those two questions, if you have something to offer on that, it would be great. The sinking or half sinking of parts of Japan was a threat not just to Japan, but was a threat around the world. False flag terrorists, uh, earthquakes, some of which are not genuine and are artificially created, are simply threats to the government of that country or surrounding countries. If you don't do what we want, you will have a major earthquake so you better do what we want you to do. That's that's a bottom line there. The CERN collider was not there to create a new portal. It was there to maintain a portal. There's a portal, that is, a major portal, that is on the verge of collapse and is predicted to collapse in 2017. There's one, one of the purposes of the Hadron Collider was to force energy up the pipe to maintain the portal. Because once a portal collapses, it cannot be re-established. You can't just send a new portal, it's just not, not possible. So one of the reasons for the CERN device was to push energy up to maintain that portal. Thank you. And if the portal did collapse, what would the consequences be and on whom would the consequences bear primarily? If the portal collapsed, then the, uh, the negative forces of the planet would no longer be able to receive reinforcements and nobody could lead from this realm to that realm. This is the last remaining direct link between this place and somewhere else. And is there a similar experiment in Japan as the CERN Collider? That's the, that is the linear collider. Uh, when Japan suffered that terrible catastrophe, and you must remember <clears throat> that prior to the catastrophe, Japan was a net exporter. Now it is a net importer. Uh, the, the deal was, if you build a linear collider, we won't sink the rest of your country. So the Japanese started to build a linear collider. This is a, a device that runs in a line, which is operates slightly differently. However, the time frame was, we couldn't get that time frame by 2017. So two years ago, two and a half years ago, they decided to enlarge the original collider, which sits on the board between France and Switzerland, uh, to increase it by some 26 miles, and thus to increase its power. Um, but they have not operated, I just want to make it clear, they have not operated it at full power. Uh, since Christmas, they've had three <coughs> breakdowns. Um, and they have 
tested it, but they have not taken it to full capacity. Um, I just want to ask a question about the good guys. Can we talk about the good guys that want to help us, meaning those races that um, we've heard that at times they turn off the nuclear silos just to let people know that they have the power to do that. Um, I have understood from listening to some of what you've said that uh, they can't come in and just take over because that's not free will and we have to be able to have, be at a certain level, but they can level the playing field. And we've talked a lot about the dark forces and I wondered if you could perhaps uh, talk about some of the, um, the forces like the Mantids, the way you've described them, that are working for the betterment and what they're doing to assist us as we're in this very critical timeline um, this next year and a half uh, before 2017. What, what I'm going to say is very difficult. But when you go home and you think about it, you will see that it has to be this way. There is a very strong argument that cannot be overturned no matter how good you are. How can 1% of the Earth's population rule 99% unless 99% wish to be ruled by the 1%? Well, that is why the good guys don't just come storming in and do away with them. Because there is a very strong argument that if we wanted to get rid of them, we would, because we outnumber them by 99%. If, if somebody else came in and got rid of them, would we not then create another ruling elite who in time would do the same to us? And again, and again, and again. That is why it has to come from within. Now what the off-world good guys have been doing is trying to make us more aware of the lies that are being given us. Now, this is happening because it's becoming harder and harder for governments to keep lies from us. You know in your own country, um, things have been coming out now which have been hidden for years and years. And it's incredibly difficult for administrations to guarantee they can keep secrets from the people. Once enough people are aware that they've been lied to, well that then I think will bring the, the, the big groundswell. And you, you yourselves are experiencing J, J. Helm, and this is the final desperate throw of uh, an elite who are desperate, and I use the word again, they're absolutely desperate to try to shore up their illegitimate uh, control by using military. Um, I did say in a recent broadcast that there have been two meetings between the President and the National Security Council. Now, I'm not talking to an English audience, so I don't need to explain how the NSA and the um, NSC work together, you will know that. But there have been two meetings, and my understanding from those meetings, you, you have about a million cops in, in America, and you have a population of 242 million, I believe. Um, the calculation was made, first of all, that the American military, by and large, would not shoot on citizens. They wouldn't carry out the order simply because so many citizens go and bake cookies to raise money for veterans and the connection between the military and the citizens is so strong that won't happen. Sadly, in your country, the vast majority of your police officers yeah. are so separate from the community that they would shoot on local people. So the report that the National Security Council took was that the army was too close to the people. 
hence J-Helm. J-Helm is doing two things. The first is a computer modeling process going on. They are calculating which states in America they would lose and which states they could maintain. Now then, you have Texans who are incredibly independent and bloody-minded and your government is very worried about Texas and you have California where people are very alternative and don't like authority your government is also worried about California so they have computer models which of the states they wish to hold maintain and which they know they can let go of so Jay Helm has been to computer model that but also to make the military feel separate from the people more about the military to make the ordinary men and women feel separate from you guys not so much to make you separate from them so you have a situation at the moment where those who are in power i mean really in power are very edgy very very edgy and in the next two years i'm sure we'll see something occur um, that will be pretty nasty. One last question about this. You mentioned that there's a great deal of patience when seeds are planted in movies and books and products as to getting people used to what's coming, like the um, UFOs that landed in schools in Germany to get kids used to the idea and little gray men woven into pictures of children and um, this this long thought movies that um, bring people into acceptance just like et like you just mentioned in this next year and a half are there certain timelines that have come now to fruition that if we were to recognize them we could say ah uh, that's what that is, and that's why that was set up. And we would have a choice point of knowing that we have a choice to go in a different direction instead of the fear that things somebody else is going to lead us out of it when in fact that's the trick. Yes. Very, very simple. I'll give you some very good advice. If you are returning to your apartment or your home, and there's a roadblock, and you're told that there's been an alien spacecraft that's crashed, and you can't go anywhere near it. So that is a genuine alien spacecraft crash. If you're told there's an alien spacecraft crash, and would you like to come up and have a look? <laughs> Hollywood has done its job to try to get you ready for the type of alien that you are expected to meet. Any little guy, three foot in height, with very big wraparound eyes, will not be something that you want to get next to, and it will be a false flag. Now, you may be aware of the triangular spacecraft. I'm sure you guys are. Yeah. Yeah. I, the American elite have first generation triangle craft, mothball, first generation, and in any false flag alien invasion, it will be this first generation triangle craft that will be flown around. You'll have half a dozen little grey robotic creatures wandering around, and you won't have regular military on the streets you will have military who are paid for by the corporations and you will be shown clips of maybe 15 or 20 seconds supposedly from um, legitimate television crews that in itself is the aim the aim is then to say right we have defeated an alien invasion but you know what we found some creatures in the spaceship that look so huge we can't tell the difference. So, would you please go to uh, point A, where you are going to be injected with a little microchip, so that every time you go to the shopping mall, you go through a scanner, we know you're a human. 
<laughs> that is our whole point of it. To engage with people with such fear. This is a world event. It's not just an American event. And I can tell you that there are many, many millions of injections ready, waiting to be given to the people at the moment they accept that this is an alien invasion. That's the situation. So the false flag is to get people willingly. It's all about free will. Willingly. Now, I often use an American term when I talk to British people. And they say, you know those old films when the 7th Cavalry come charging in and save the day? <laughs> well, you are the 7th Cavalry. You are the Queen. Something else which you won't know. The whole purpose wasn't to take away your guns. It was to take away a certain type of gun. In any conflict between the citizens and the armed forces, whoever they may be, here's the scenario that I was given. I'm not going to use any names. If you want to shoot me, I'm just using the person who was talking to me. If you want to shoot me, you have to come out of your window and shoot me. But if I want to shoot you, I'll just shoot straight through your walls. Because we will take away the high-powered weaponry. So only we will have the high-powered weaponry, and the citizens won't. Well, that was the point of all the false flags, to prevent the citizens having high-powered weaponry. So this is a plan that has been taking fruition for 15 years. But the law of the New World Order got held up, and it is delayed, because by their plans, they should already have had the New World Order, and they've been thwarted. And this is what's causing all the fractions at the top, all the arguments. You know that you can get an app for your phone and when you go to pay for something, you just put your phone or you swipe your phone. You guys have had that for a long time. This only came to Great Britain just over a year ago. And this was all part of this rather evil plan. Your country is like my country. You go onto the, uh, the sidewalk and everybody's got their phone in their hand. That's the way it is. So you have this thing in your phone and you swipe it or you put it down and you get your whatever it is you bought. Well the plan was 10 years ago that you got so used to doing that that they said to you why don't we just put this straight in your hand? You just put your hand down on the plate they will read it and you can buy what you want. You've seen your own adverts on your own television where the woman says I can't wait to get an implant in my hand so that I can open the garage doors without going outside. <laughs> Actors paid for to push this. You know yourself that there is a very heavy plan to try and get newborn babies chipped and identified. So they are really desperately pushing this. And it mustn't happen. It mustn't happen because Whilst I said to you I believe in God, I have a problem with religion, I actually don't have a problem with the Bible. Because the Bible talks about the mark of the beast. And I can tell you now that that is what the mark of the beast is. Something alien in your body that allows somebody else to control you. Now whether that goes in your forehead or whether it goes in your hand, it doesn't matter. in its true sense is one of the greatest books ever written but we have interpreted it incorrectly so it is a warning it's an absolute warning so you know but, but knowledge is power and the more we are aware of this the more the elite think ah right well they've tumbled us they've worked out our plan we're going to have to think 
of another plan. You don't need to go on the streets and fire guns. You just have to know what the plan is. Then they have to go away and come up with another plan. And so we keep going until they run out of time. Well, thank you, Simon, for all those marvelous, inspiring, thought-provoking insights. We've reached the time for our short break. And how, how would about 20 minutes work with you before we resume? Is that in... Do you want to do 15 minutes or 20 minutes? All right, 15, whatever you prefer. Okay, so it's now, in your country, it's now 10.38 p.m. Okay. You calculated that very well. <laughs> I have practice. I also have two cats. I need to be sharp. All right, we take, thank you so much again. That was absolutely phenomenal. And we will do 15 minutes.